we are here providing a workshop, hands-on workshop, on how to do a personal medicine monitoring device with its application that helps monitor the healthcare management of the patient. The fact of being a hands-on training and actually developing the device and therefore the app for it, it's very enriching and it's giving us a lot of skills and more of a critical thinking is developing our creativity a little bit more, so I'm really enjoying this workshop. I think it's very relevant to invite me to speak about raw food in the personalized medicine theme because Hippocrates is the father of medicines. He said, let your food be your medicine. And it's so powerful. So it would lead me to, to try more raw food and experience with my taste more and with my smell. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this keynote uh, lecture by Natasha McEnroe. It's a very interesting uh, subject that she will cover. <clears throat> but uh, before I leave the floor to her, uh, I will say a few words about her distinguished career. So currently, Natasha is the keeper of medicine at the Science Museum in London. And uh, in her previous uh, position, she was director of the Florence Nightingale Museum. And before that, she was the manager uh, of the Grant Museum of Zoology and Comparative Anatomy and curator of the Galton Collection at University College London. She has been a curator of Dr. Johnson's house in London's Fleet Street and has also worked for the National Trust and the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, in addition to uh, this work of curating um, medical uh, displays, historical uh, uh, and different historical artifacts, uh, she has also uh, been actively engaged in uh, editing. Uh, in particular, she was the co-editor of the hospital in the Oatfield, uh, The Art of Nursing in First World War, published in 2014, uh, and other books, The Tyranny of Treatment, Samuel Johnson, His Friends, and Georgian Medicine in 2003, and she's editor of Medicine and Imperfect Science, 2019, and co-editor of the Medicine Cabinet in very recently. Her research uh, interest uh, is in uh, 18th and 19th century medical humanities, and Natasha is also part of a, a historical uh, livery, an organization which has a really uh, interesting denomination. Uh, uh, she's a freeman of the Worshipful Company of Barbers. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, that has to do with, uh, in the past, historically, uh, some uh, you know, professions has to be organized in corporations or libraries. And, uh, there was one for barbers and surgeons. Uh, now they split. Barbers uh, do other things than surgeons. But anyway, this is uh, actually a historical denomination. And uh, this uh, um, company is really involved with uh, charitable work. So uh, what we will see today uh, is a, a, a review of uh, what is widely regarded as the largest and finest museum collection relating to medicine in the world. It's really a privilege for us to be exposed to this. Uh, and um, the, Natasha is the lead curator and keeper of uh, medicine uh, for, uh, in particular, this historic collection that includes uh, artifacts from the, uh, or, art or e elements or objects from the Henry Welcome as well as the Science Museum own medical collection. So thank you very much, Natasha, for taking the time to come here and welcome to Kaust.
thank you very much indeed. And thank you in particular for the invitation to speak here today. It's, um, it's an absolute honor to present at such a, an inspiring and varied program of events. Um, I've been particularly encouraged by the many conversations that have been happening around me um, over, over the past few days, um, partly as a response to some of the presentations that we've heard. Now, in my lecture today, I'm going to be taking a slightly different angle to the ones that we've heard about in previous talks, because we're going to be looking at how personalised medicine looks like from the perspective of the history of medicine. And in particular, we're going to look at how we have communicate focused medicine from the past, present and future in a museum context. Personalised medicine is by no means a new thing, and this is something that I hope I'm going to be communicating um, during the course of my talk. It's been understood for centuries that people have got um, an, a unique and a very individual health system, and targeting what might best work for individual people is something that has long been understood. Even identifying and managing risk um, perhaps in the past, people might have understood something along the lines of uh, some, a condition would run in a family or there would be a tendency to a certain health condition. And this would be years before there was, of course, any understanding of genetics. What is new today is the accuracy that predictions can be made and the way that we can communicate technology with diagnoses. Um, and this means that the, that the prediction of risk is becoming extremely accurate. So where do museums fit in with all of this? How can the historic objects in museum collections, but also the more um, modern and contemporary objects that we collect today, um, how do these help us monitor and map medical progress and development? Now, fortunately for medical curators such as myself, medical practitioners have always understood the importance of their own heritage. It's something that traditionally um, doctors have always absolutely loved their own history, and they've collected accordingly. And many of their enthusiasm and their impassioned collecting has made its way into museum collections all over the world, and this includes in my own collection at the Science Museum. So my perspective as a historian of medicine, um, and this means, as I said, combining the historic with the contemporary science and communicating that to, um, to a wider public. So particularly around the contemporary collecting, this means that we have to work, my team and myself, with um, experts in biomedicine, so whether they're scientists or researchers um, or medical practitioners, we rely on them to predict when there'll be a step change. We love a prototype. It's something that's really, really hard for us to predict what might be of interest to a researcher in 50 or 100 years' time. Um, perhaps most of all, uh, from my own point of view as a historian, the historic items in museum collections provide evidence of the importance of treating people as individuals and as complex beings, and really as patients, and sooner or later, that's all of us. Now, what I'd like to do this evening is to use as a case study um, the Science Museum that we see on screen at the moment, their suite of new medicine galleries. Now, these only opened um, two months ago, so it's something that we are still very excited and very enthusiastic about. But using the new medicine galleries, we are going to be exploring what are the historic milestones that we can look at in our search for individualized medicine, and how do we actively collect today with an eye for the future? Now, what I'd like to do as a beginning is just to say a few words about the background to the Science Museum. Now, the Science Museum is one of three museums in South Kensington, the V&A, which is a museum of art, and the Natural History Museum. 
And these are originally one museum, the South Kensington Museum, and the collections grew from what was known as the Great Exhibition that we have on screen at the moment. And these, this was an enormous, um, giant endeavour that was set up in London's Hyde Park um, in 1851. The Great Exhibition was organised by Prince Albert, who was the husband of Queen Victoria. And this was a, a triumphant celebration of the industrial achievements. And the collections um, eventually formed the museums that we've just, um, we've just uh, mentioned, and also Imperial College that I know from discussions is known to many of you. So the Science Museum is, um, is just next door to Imperial, and all of them are just a stone's throw um, from Hyde Park, which is where, um, where the Great Exhibition was, already, was originally set up. So the museums gradually divided and the Science Museum originally became its own independent entity in 1909. And it's been open to the public ever since. Now, originally, um, at the Science Museum, medicine did not form a particularly important part of the collections. But this was all to change in 1979, when we became the recipient of a very significant loan um, a, really of a museum collection in its own right, the spectacular collection of Henry Wellcome. And this is, I, I, don't say, I won't say a permanent loan, because that's an oxymoron, but it's a, a long-term loan to the Science Museum. As I said, it's been, been with us since, um, since, 19, uh, since the early 1980s, because it took a few years to pack up. Um, and this really saw the birth of the Science Museum's own interest in medicine. And that's when we started actively collecting um, ourselves. The Wellcome Trust, known to many of you, very active, of course, in, in biomedical research, was founded on the fortune of the man we have on screen at the moment, Henry Wellcome. And Wellcome made his money from um, a highly successful pharmaceutical company. Um, he was extremely wealthy, but as well as being a successful businessman, he was also a, really an obsessive collector. He thought that if he could just gather enough stuff, that he could somehow communicate the, um, uh, understand perhaps the, the laws of humanity relating to health and well-being. And I'm sure many of us love to collect, and we have, you know, we have little collections of things, whether it's stamps or something else. But for Wellcome, due to his wealth, there was no limit to his spending. So he could employ, employ people, they could go all over the world and basically collect this enormous global collection. Uh, by the time he died, there was um, well over a million objects um, that became, became um, dispersed. Uh, he originally exhibited at what he called the Wellcome Historical Medical Museum, and uh, this opened in 1913 in London. And it featured a hall of primitive medicine, a hall of statuary, a portrait gallery, and various period rooms and reconstructions. And if my curatorial team goes through these um, historic um, photographs of the original museum, we can recognize quite a lot of the, um, the original collection. Um, the museum was originally set up in Wigmore Street, but it moved to the Euston Road, which, again, as many of you will know, is still the headquarters to the Wellcome Trust today. So, as I said, since the, um, the 70s, the vast historic Wellcome collection has been stored and cared for at the Science Museum, and we work in partnership very closely with the Wellcome Trust. Um, I'm pleased to say the collection is a lot more rational and organised than it was at the time of, um, of Henry Wellcome's death, but it's, um, it's still a vast collection. Um, so under my direct care is well over 150,000 objects. Um, this is roughly about two-thirds historic welcome loan and one-third Science Museum's own collection. But as we, as we continue to collect today, that, that percentage, obviously, um, is, is changing. 
So, in previous years in the Science Museum, the medicine galleries were displayed um, up on the fourth and fifth floors, so right up on the top of the museum. And as you can see from the photograph on screen at the moment, they were probably in need of a little bit of a refresh in the way that they were displayed. They hadn't really been changed since the 80s. So about eight or nine years ago, the Science Museum decided that they wanted to commit to having a very, very significant redisplay of medicine. So they opened up, they committed most of the first floor, um, which in British terms is the second floor up. So we have the ground floor and then the first floor. Um, and this is the biggest project that the Science Museum has ever done. Um, it cost over 24 million pounds. And as I said, we've just literally just opened um, in, uh, in November. And at the heart of all of these galleries is the idea of communicating focused and personalized medicine, past and present, provoking thought and debate into our healthcare today. So what I'd like to do is to give a brief introduction of the, the three narrative galleries. And as we look at each gallery, um, to examine a few of the, the different milestones over time that relate to managing the health and the well-being of the individual. On screen at the moment, um, we have the monumental sculpture uh, that was created especially for, for the gallery by um, artist superstar Mark Quinn. And um, the, uh, the statue is called Self-Conscious Gene, and uh, it's uh, photographed here uh, with my colleague Imogen, who is one of my curatorial team. Um, Imogen is actually a very tall girl. She's a lot taller than I am. So this gives you an idea of some of the scale of the statue. So when people, when people come in, they're greeted with this, this um, enormous um, human body, I suppose. And throughout the galleries, we've used specially commissioned pieces of contemporary art to, um, to really explore um, history of healthcare and contemporary culture. And um, in the time I've spent at KAUST, I've been particularly interested in looking at some of the pieces of um, outdoor sculpture and artworks inside as well, that um, exploring science um, in, in a similar way. So this is the, uh, the first gallery, Medicine and Bodies. Um, the previous one showing the statue, it's very atmospheric. So this is Medicine and Bodies with the lights switched on, so you can actually see something of the, of the gallery. And this is really um, focusing on looking at what we've learned about and through the human body over time. So looking at pathology and studying dead bodies through dissection, um, through creating images and measuring um, at different parts of the body and calculating data around this, and also uh, looking at the body on a molecular scale. And, of course, these methods have been used for centuries um, to try and work out the best way to treat and to manage good health. So here's one very intriguing mass display that we have in Medicine and Bodies. And at first glance, we're finding that our visitors think that this is another art um, installation because it has that look at, about it. Um, but as they get closer, they realize it's actually a display of human stones. So kidney stones, gall stones. Um, each of the circles on the display um, contains stones that were collected from um, one individual. So sometimes they're very small. The largest one is the size of a mango. Um, very, very painful condition. Um, they are, it's quite an important collection because it was collected by the Irish chemist Kathleen Lonsdale, who was um, an expert crystallographer. And um, she and her team created new techniques in the 1960s that are still used today. And she was a, um, uh, a, very, um, uh, a, very, a, a very forward and influential um, thinker and worker. Um, the gallery Medicine and Bodies gave us a, 
a great opportunity to show off some of the, the really big parts of, the, of their collection. Um, and some of the technology that allowed us to, to really see for the first time um, inside the human body without, resulting, uh, without resorting to surgery um, or to dissection, without cutting open. So we have on screen at the moment the world's first MRI scanner. And again, it's this technology that you can look at the various soft tissues and organs um, in a way that have just um, been, been unheard of before. Um, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI as we know it, um, was of course a really groundbreaking piece of technology. These magnetic coils were used in 1977 at the University of Nottingham in the, the Midlands in England by Peter Mansfield. Um, and it was the first time that a human body was scanned in this way. Um, slightly ironically, when the uh, coils were delivered to the university, the, um, the lorry that they were delivered in broke down. So the team was waiting very anxiously. Um, when we were waiting anxiously to put this, this in um, a few months ago, the delivery van also broke down. It weighs two and a half tons. It, is, it was um, a, bit of a, a bit of a nightmare to install, but looks amazing on gallery. Now, from a, an enormous um, part of the collection to a tiny part, this would, would fit into the, into the palm of your hand. This is Anthony von Leeuwenhoek's microscope. And I think that this object tells quite a nice story of how the commercial world can overlap with, um, with the medical world and the scientific world. Um, van Leeuwenhoek was, um, in the 1600s, was a textile merchant, and he, used, he was, became expert in lenses and in magnifying glasses because he used them to check the, um, the quality of cloth. So he adapted um, a little gadget um, to, um, to, to place uh, in order to, to magnify. So if you place a small specimen on the, the end of the screw and then turn it, you could, using this gadget, magnify by up to 200 times, which at this time was a, an enormous leap forward and meant that they could see um, all sorts of, um, of things that they, they simply weren't able to see. Moving on to the next gallery, um, medicine and communities, we're really widening out our gaze into how um, individualized medicine works within groups of people, within communities and societies. And this examine, this um, gallery looks at how we can manage health through physical separation, um, such as um, quarantine or isolation, um, infectious diseases, and also contemporary um, and historic issues that affect health. Um, so, for example, problems with addiction, such as smoking, um, and we also look at obesity and healthy eating as well. Of course, when we think about global issues that affect um, the health of communities as well as individuals, one of the things that uh, I think we'll think of uh, quite, quite early on is um, vaccine reluctance. Now, to be able to tell the story of vaccination through using iconic objects in the collection is something that means that museums can play a really important role in encouraging thought around the history of vaccination. It's, it's always been controversial. Um, there's never been a time that every single person thinks vaccination's a good idea. So to, to showcase, to perhaps remind people of the reality of once common um, uh, diseases is a role that museums can play. So um, we have on screen uh, an example of an iron lung, which is a full body respirator. And the Science Museum has the biggest collection of iron lungs in, um, in the world. But again, just simply due to the, the sheer size and scale of the new medicine galleries means that we're able to, um, to display one of these. This is a 1953 version called the Smith-Clark. Um, it's known as the alligator because it's hinged at one end, so it sort of opens lengthways. 
And um, for those of you that don't know, this was used for people affected by polio, which um, causes paralysis, um, muscular paralysis, um, often of arms and legs. But if it um, affects your chest muscles, people would quite literally suffocate. And sometimes they, would, they could recover quite quickly, but would need to be, um, to be kept alive during this time. So the iron lungs work by placing all of the body apart from the head um, inside and um, is sealed off around the neck. And then the engine creates negative and positive pressure that causes the chest to um, compress and contract and release and then um, force air in and out. And I think that such, such a powerful piece of machinery can only encourage thought um, around um, what infectious diseases of, of the past um, would, would really look like. It's certainly a, a grim reminder of what, of what life was like um, in, in, before there was an effective vaccination against polio. So in one of the cases, we have um, a very, very pretty blue netting draped up when we're looking at um, infectious diseases, but it's not just there for decoration. It's, of course, a life-saving piece of equipment. Now, fine, fine mesh methods for preventing against malaria have been used ever since uh, we learned that it was uh, transmitted by mosquitoes, which was actually um, fairly recently because for many years there was a lot of misunderstanding about how, um, how uh, malaria was, um, was transmitted. It was only discovered in 1897, so right at the very end of the, the 19th century. And the discovery was made by a doctor called Robert Ross, who dissected a mosquito and discovered the, um, the malaria parasite inside. He'd observed the mosquito um, sucking the blood of, a, um, of a malaria, somebody suffering from malaria. So the Oliset net goes one step further by impregnating the netting with insecticide. Um, it's, uh, the insecticide is called permethrin that was uh, discovered or invented rather in Japan in the 70s and after being approved by the World Health Organization has been distributed worldwide. It's, um, it's a uh, massive success rate. Um, it's, uh, it's estimated that it saved over 600,000 lives and averted potentially over 100 million cases of malaria. Um, so that's not bad for a fairly a simple piece of, of netting. It's uh, one of the really nice things about it is that you can wash it and it remains um, effective for, for up, to, up to five years. So the, the final gallery that, we are, that we're looking at today is medicine and treatments. And this is probably the one that is most closely aligned um, to the theme of the conference in our search for individualized health, in our search for personalized medicine. And here we examine how the health of the individual can be managed and how this has changed through time. We look at surgery, different therapies ranging from electrotherapy to physiotherapy, and finally, to the vast subject of drugs. And we've even got our very own Victorian pharmacy uh, that people can go into and they have a, an immersive experience. There's a soundscape and they get a sense of what it would have been like um, to have gone into a pharmacy um, at the, the turn of the last century. Um, and again, this is a, a reminder of the, I suppose really that, that um, the continuity of medical practice and treatment because um, there, of course, are still chemists and pharmacies on every high street today. And um, it's also a reminder of how the commercial development um, of drugs and pharmaceuticals goes hand in hand with, um, with um, medical research and um, discovery. They're very, very, very closely entwined. And again, when we're looking at the, the history of health going in cycles, um, infection control, antibiotic resistance, we have um, a very large case dedicated to this. Um, uh, this is a sample of penicillium mold 
that was presented by Alexander Fleming himself uh, but to his good friend Douglas MacLeod. And the mould began life as a, really as a laboratory curiosity. They observed that um, bacteria around the mould would start to behave very strangely and, and die off. But it was really only Fleming who discovered, who, who really thought that this was particularly significant. And he had on the, a watch plate that we have here some of the spores mounted and preserved for his friend. And MacLeod's family later had this mounted in brass, and the Science Museum um, acquired it. Um, but we have this because the, the medicine galleries aren't arranged chronologically, they're arranged thematically. So we have the penicillium mold uh, arranged with uh, current uh, um, inventions around infection control. Um, so award-winning hospital furniture that's uh, much easier to clean because it has no, no sharp corners, for example. So um, looking at issues around, particularly around um, infection control, um, the uh, theme of antibiotic resistance, again, means that the, the role of history is becoming more significant than ever as we are exploring, as we've heard in previous talks, exploring new solutions, but also looking back to a time when infection was quite literally a matter of life and death. So alongside the, the historic and the, um, the modern material culture, in the medicine galleries, we use digital interactives as a way of hoping to educate, to inspire, and to provoke thought. In, really into all of the, the bigger picture of how our health is maintained. So to still look at the, um, the subject of drugs, uh, we've got on screen at the moment people um, playing a game in which they um, are trying to get a drug on the market. So they go through um, all of the different stages of um, clinical tests, research, um, uh, testing it on, on sample groups, drug trials, identifying risk, and then finally, if they've managed to be successful, then they launch a successful drug onto the, onto the market. So for our final milestone, I'd like to offer up keyhole and robotic surgery. So for centuries, of course, if we look at surgery, um, although there has been, uh, in, you know, in the last century, very important developments around anesthesia, infection control, blood loss, but in many ways the actual technique of surgery itself has remained unchanged. And um, this was the case right up until the wider use of keyhole or minimally invasive surgery in the 1980s. And this meant that, yes, it was a, a major change in the way that patients experience surgery, but it also was a major change in the way that surgeons worked, because um, instead, of, instead of working by sight, um, they, you know, very directly um, inside the human body, they were having to completely change the whole way that they worked. So really, with only minor incisions um, and fiber optics, the face of surgery changed completely. And following uh, minimally invasive surgery, we can see the development of robotic surgery, and on the screen at the moment, we've got the Da Vinci robotic system. And here you have the, the surgeon who sits at the console, and he, he doesn't even need to be that near the patient, because he's viewing um, a, a, 3D, um, a 3D version of the, um, of the, the patient's um, insides. And the, uh, his or her hand movements of the surgeon translate into the patient cart and tiny, incredibly accurate movements um, are made. And the advantage of this, of course, is that the natural um, slight tremor of the human hand can be reduced and there's a much greater maneuverability as well than in because the, um, the, the, um, it can move in a number of different ways. So the galleries that we've just looked at, and I really can't emphasize enough, I have just whizzed you through a very, very few highlights, um, are 
um, because there, there are literally thousands um, of, of, of objects on display. Um, they all have one thing in common. They are milestones in the history of medicine. And as such, they won't date. Now, I need to explain, I think, what, what I mean by that. So to put together a permanent gallery of any sort is something that takes huge amounts of time, huge amounts of planning. Um, to have any change um, in a permanent gallery is expensive um, in terms of um, human resources as well as financial resources. To make any uh, changes in display involves curatorial research. Um, we would have to get the conservators involved, technicians. Uh, we'd have to have the designers um, printing up new labels. It's, it's very, very expensive and time-consuming. So because of that, the decision was made to have um, only, uh, um, only very significant um, step change objects, I suppose, on, um, on gallery. So when displaying robotic surgery, uh, we didn't display the most recent piece of kit that we could get our hands on, because by next year, um, that would be out of date. So this key piece of equipment is the first time that um, the, the piece of kit that was used for the very first time that robotic surgery was carried out in a, a clinical situation um, by Lord Darcy. And we were very grateful to Lord Darcy for sharing his experience of what that felt like. And that is displayed, um, the video is displayed on gallery next to this object. So our aim in terms of sustainability is to have the medicine galleries lasting for 25 years um, and at the end of 25 years, this will still be the first time that um, robotic surgery was used in a clinical situation. So this leaves us, of course, with the problem is that how do we then explore contemporary and developing science and biomedicine, which can change really, really quickly? And the answer to that is that we are... We're very, we're very lucky at the Science Museum because we have a, a very big public programming um, department. We can put on major events. Um, on the screen at the moment, um, I'm showing you an event that took place last spring celebrating the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web, um, which we were delighted to celebrate with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Looking at not just the past, but the future of the internet. But as well as terrific events like this, we, perhaps the most important way that we celebrate um, uh, current health issues is through our temporary exhibition programme. And our, our next big exhibition, which is due to open in spring 2021, um, is about one of the most important areas of personalised medicine at all, cancer research. We have on screen at the moment some breast cancer cells. And the exhibition's provisionally called Living Longer with Cancer, and it's exploring how evolution-focused research is reshaping our relationship with cancer and helping more of us than ever before to live longer and better with cancer. And we're, we're very pleased to be working with Cancer Research UK, so the research element is right at the heart of the exhibition. Um, it makes the research, of course, is making the difference between cancer being a killer disease and being a chronic condition that people can live with for, for many years. We're hoping that the exhibition will help our visitors make sense of what cancer is and explore how we've actually got to this historic point in cancer care. And also, I mean, cancer, of course, is a, is a difficult subject for many of us, but we actually hope to inspire hope in many of our visitors. Some of the, the, um, the research that's being carried out is, is really inspiring and exciting. Um, we are telling the, the story through the perspective of patients and researchers and clinicians 
who are, are working together to explore cancer's ability to evolve, to really be a, a moving target. Um, we're looking at innovations, the technology innovations in imaging, um, sequencing, and data science technologies. And we're showcasing how researchers are really turning the challenges of cancer evolution into opportunities. Um, and we really believe that this is going to be one of the very first exhibitions to look at cancer in this way. So throughout my talk this evening, we have looked at personalized medicine from a historic perspective. And in particular, I've shared how I feel that museums can contribute to this debate and how I feel that they play really a crucial role. We've examined some of the milestones on display at the Science Museum that relate to personalized medicine. And these range from the development of technology, that means that we can look inside the human body, to using drugs to target individual health issues. Now, one of the things that we hope that people will take away from coming to the medicine galleries is that treatments development of medicine and treatments change. Things get forgotten over time, they can um, come back into use, fashions change, things have to be relearned. But there is one thing for sure, and that is that there is a lot that science still doesn't understand about the human body. By sharing the historic material culture, we can gain a much needed perspective into how to best care for the health of the individual now. The issues that people faced both today and in the past are global and universal. So the information that we can display on gallery provides a link not just across the centuries, but across all of the world. Because if there's one thing that unites all of us, it's that we care very deeply about the health of ourselves and the health of those around us. So therefore, the job of the museum curator of medicine is not just to display and um, to care for and interpret um, this material, but it's to actively collect and to preserve for future researchers so that they can study the most fascinating story in the world, the story of ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Natasha, for this wonderful journey in the museum. Uh, we have time for questions. Who would like to start? Over there, yes. Um, can can some, is there someone? If not, uh, let me just bring this. Oh. They always make me nervous, those things. I'm worried that someone's going to get their glasses knocked off or something. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. I was wondering if you also have included in the, in the collection medical devices or, or otherwise uh, cures that people at the time thought would work but later found out didn't. Or is that outside of the scope of what you're collecting? Yeah, that's a really, really, really good question, and one of the um, one of the most difficult ones that um, that we had to answer. Um, I mean, this, the looking at placebo in particular is is fascinating and huge. Um, it didn't really fit into the, the the narratives of the galleries, or indeed in, into our collection because we were working with the strength of what of what um, people did. Um, we've explored what people think works, I, I suppose a different way, of, of let me explain a different way. So um, in one of our galleries called Faith, Hope and Fear, yeah. we are exploring people's um, relationship with trust and faith that they have. So this can be faith in their treatment, in their doctor, but it could also be um, religious faith um, or um, support of loved ones. And um, these are things that we know has direct health outcomes, 
but might not be strictly science. And it's a real challenge for us because we have to display what's accurate, but some things aren't, and some things we sidestep in some ways when things are controversial. So, for example, when we have on display um, sad lamps, you probably don't know what these are living here, but in, if you live in horrible countries like England, it's very dark a lot of the year, and um, using um, a, a light, light box, some people feel it really improves their mental health in the winter months. Some people feel that it does literally no good at all. So we have displayed one on gallery along with historic light therapy, um, and we illustrate it with two quotes from people one person who felt it really helped her and another person who felt it did not, no good at all. So, I'm sorry, I feel that was a bit of an incoherent question, answer to your question, but it's just, it's a very big and complicated question. Yes, a question over there, if you, uh, up there first. Yep. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you for taking us through a journey through time. You mentioned focused medicine. I would like to ask you um, a question of how history or historically medical practitioners um, paid sort of focused attention to their patients. And I ask this question in the context of us living in a golden era of medicine where we see new sort of advances every day, yet when we go to our doctors, we see very little personal focus. And I would also like to know your thoughts on what history sort of tells us about um, how we can perhaps solve this problem where, you know, the patient-doctor relationship is sort of defocusing. Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the, your first bit of the question. Yes. Um, so you, you talked about a phrase about, you know, focused medicine. Yeah. And I just was wondering what are your thoughts on how historically fo focused doctors have been towards their patients. And then um, within the context of today where we see doctors mm. are becoming less and less or have less and less time to focus on the patients. Yeah. So how yes, we, I see what you mean. we see this playing yes. out. Yeah. So yeah, that's another massive, massive question in other words. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, again, it's, it's something that's, that's such an enormous question and has um, so much variety over time because it would, it would depend entirely on the levels of care being produced and the circumstances of the, of the individual person in the past. I mean, of course, in the past, both in um, Western and Eastern cultures, the... Um, uh, treatment's been given very much through religious organisations and it's been um, given in, in, in that sort of way. Um, uh, and that has that's changed as, as time, has, time has gone on. And as for relationships today, I mean, again, it's something that varies enormously. Um, I mean, I, I personally would like to see more understanding into the, the holistic treatment of, of the individuals. And certainly in the... In the UK, um, there's an, I feel that maybe there's an aim for that to happen, um, but it's not necessarily carried through. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, my husband has got a, a bad knee, and he went along to our doctor and just said, I've got a bad knee. And the doctor has to go through a checklist of, you know, what do you want to happen? You know, what do you think is wrong with it? And, you know, what do you think treatments might work? And my husband's just like, I just want my knee to stop hurting, mate. You know, I don't care. I haven't got a view. You're the doctor. Um, so, yes, it's, uh, I'm probably sidestepping your question because I think it's too big and too complicated. <laughs> question here. Um, hopefully this is an easier um, question to answer. What would you really dearly love to have in your exhibition that you don't currently have? And how do you persuade people that ah. they might like to display your, their objects? Well, I mean, actually, persuading people... Sorry, to take the second half first. Persuading people to, um, to display the objects is fairly easy because people like the idea that something's going on gallery and people, people will see it. Um, what's difficult is persuading them um, that we want to store it. So in any national museum, you have, you know, even the, you know, the v and uh, the Science Museum, Natural History Museum, the vast majority of the collection is not out there. 
you might have 3% that's on display and the rest is in stores. So our trouble is actually persuading people that they want to give us things to put in storage for, for the future. Um, what was the first thing that you asked? What would I like to see? Um, I would like to see collecting more artificial intelligence. And that is something that I'm, I'm finding quite challenging at the moment. Um, we rely very much on our relationships we have um, through um, our colleagues at Imperial in the big hospitals around, and they're able to advise us. Um, so that, that would, that's something that I'm, I'm keen on at the moment. A big acquisition that we've got going through at the moment is around the history of ultrasound. And again, that's particularly important because a lot of the pioneers who worked with that are now getting very elderly. And if we want to collect, as we do, their personal stories as well, we need to move quite quickly. So ultrasound would be another one. I've got many. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, over there. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Uh, hi. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, I do hope I get the chance to visit the museum one day. Uh, I was wondering that, because you mentioned that you put more emphasis on the, the first or the original uh, form of each of the instruments or each of the uh, treatment methods. Uh, do you put more emphasis on like the evolution of each method and if that's so, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you solve the problem of giving the correct information to people? So sometimes like, there's a new research that's very exciting, but it's not very recognized. Mm. So do you put that uh, emphasis on those critical points uh, as to, like, mm. to perform uh, or to give the perfect information that is uh, correctly uh, correct and accurate in uh, all respects? Yeah. Yes, uh, again, uh, that would be something like that that's, that's very new, has the potential to be really exciting. We would almost certainly explore through our events program and get you know, the people who are working on it, the experts in the field, have a discussion, have an audience, and have uh, things like that going on. That would be really difficult to do, um, to do in a permanent gallery. Um, to do for a temporary exhibition like the cancer one I was describing, we certainly would want something that you know, was significant because, again, you have years of research going into even a temporary, a temporary exhibition. Um, in terms of how things change um, over time, um, on the, the medicine gallery, so for example, when we've looked at um, trephination, like you know, cutting small holes out of the skull, um, so we have on display a real human skull that dates back to prehistoric times, and that shows the, um, the bone growing over um, slightly. So it shows that that person survived that surgery. We say why we think that they carried it out, um, look at um, a brain surgery today and how this might have been uh, used in, um, you know, in a different way today. So by trying to take a bigger picture, I suppose. Does that, does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. No other questions, I see. So thank you again very much, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the memory for oh, thank you. Uh, this uh, 2020 <laughs> Web at Cows, please. Thank uh, you. <laughs> this. this is our small token thank of you. appreciation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.